belly breathing. Um, sometimes I think the description, it may be a little bit confusing. So when we think about breathing, the primary driver to breathe is carbon dioxide. Brain stem, this is a stalk-like structure which is connecting the brain to the spinal cord. And we have a respiratory center which is monitoring carbon dioxide, blood pH, and to a lesser extent oxygen. When carbon dioxide increases, blood pH drops, the brain stem will send a signal via the phrenic nerve to the diaphragm. The diaphragm breathing muscle, which is just at the base of your ribs, moves downwards. And during rest, the diaphragm, it will only move down by about two to three centimeters. Your intercostal muscles at your size, etc., will pull out. This increases the volume of your chest cavity, which creates a vacuum inside the chest, and this, in turn, is drawing air into the lungs. So now we have to think about this in connection with the term belly breathing. So belly breathing would imply that as you breathe in, your belly moves out, and as you breathe out, your belly moves in. So let's look at it a little bit deeper. When your diaphragm is moving downwards, you're not just going to have movement to the front. You're also going to have movement to the sides. You're going to have some movement to the back. And an even better way to determine whether you were breathing high or whether you were breathing low is to have your hands at your lower ribs. As you breathe in, are you able to gently push your ribs outwards? And as you breathe out, do you feel your ribs moving inwards? And that's much more accurate in terms of belly breathing because you could be working with a client and they, you have asked the client to breathe abdominally and they may, be, they may be pushing and pulling their belly irrespective of their breathing. But a better gauge of whether that person is breathing well from a biomechanical point of view is when they breathe in, are they able to generate enough intra-abdominal pressure to push the ribs outwards? And it's very, very important that we have good breathing use of the diaphragm, that the diaphragm is moving freely because there's so many factors involved here. The diaphragm isn't just a main breathing muscle. The greatest concentration of blood flow is in the lower lobes of the lungs. And by breathing through your nose, you tend to take the air into the lower region. So nose breathing is actually a deeper breath, but a deep breath doesn't mean a big breath. And I will come to that in another video because that can be another um source of confusion. So we will talk about that. But as you breathe through your nose, you harness this gas called nitric oxide. And nitric oxide is being continuously produced in the nasal airway locally and also in the paranasal sinuses. So by breathing through the nose, you're carrying this nitric oxide laden air into the lungs. And nitric oxide redistributes the blood throughout the lungs. But nose breathing is taking the air into the deeper regions of the lungs. So by breathing through your nose, and taking the air into the lower regions of the lungs, it increases gas exchange. So basically, oxygen transfers more readily from the lungs into the blood. And uh, this was discovered back in 1988. There was a researcher called Swift, and he was looking at individuals. They were after having jaw surgery. And of course, with jaw surgery, their jaws were, were wired shut. So it forced them, they had no other choice in the matter, but to continuously breathe through their nose. And when the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood was investigated or examined, they found that the PO2 in millimeters of mercury, as measured, that it increased by nearly 10%. So we think about nasal breathing and good recruitment of the diaphragm and how that can increase gas exchange from the lungs to the blood. But it just doesn't stop there. The diaphragm itself has so many, many other important uses so, for example, every breath that you take, and if we're breathing normally, 12, 14 breaths per minute, um, you're talking about 60 minutes per hour, 24 hours per day, you know, we could be breathing 10, 15,000 times per day. And every breath that we breathe is massaging the internal organs. And this is also very important in terms of lymphatic drainage. So our lymph system is almost like the, the you know, the body's sewage system in terms of getting weight, getting rid of waste from the body but it doesn't have a pump of its own so it relies on the movement of the diaphragm and with good diaphragmatic breathing it can help with lymphatic drainage. Another aspect is in terms of the diaphragm in providing stabilization of the spine and because 50% of people with lower back pain have dysfunctional breathing patterns. Now you could ask is it the lower back pain that is causing dysfunctional breathing or is it dysfunctional breathing 
from a biomechanical point of view, in other words, the person is breathing high rather than breathing low, that their poor breathing from a biomechanical point of view is not providing adequate stabilization for the spine. And as a result, then this can be contributing to increased risk of lower back pain. Another aspect of the diaphragm is the connection between the diaphragm and, and the emotions. So the instruction is to take a deep breath. The instruction is correct, but is the interpretation correct? And uh, we will look at that soon, as I said. So think of your nose and think of your diaphragm. And the diaphragm as being the most important um, breathing muscle and how it works for you, that it goes beyond the term belly breathing.